day today. Today we're going to talk about what are you seeking. We're going to talk about uh, your focus. We're going to talk about what to seek. We're going to look at this amazing truth out of Matthew and then we're going to look at one of the, well now I'm not going to say one of, we're going to look at the wisest man that has ever lived. We're going to look at Solomon and we're going to look at a passage that we taught months and months and months ago. But I think what happened with Solomon between his conversation between him and God is one of the greatest principles that you could receive if you understood what it meant to focus on the right thing. So before we get started, I want to go ahead and pray. So Father, I thank you. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let this word become wisdom revelation in the knowledge of your son. Spiritual seed sown. Let it produce in our body, mind, will, and emotion, transforming us by the renewing of our mind, conforming us into the image of Christ, growing us up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. God, we love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, as we get into this lesson today, I want you to go into Matthew, go into the Gospel of Matthew, and we're going to look at chapter 6, and we're going to start at verse 25. And we're going to read some verses in Matthew first, and then we're going to go into the book of First Kings. So let's get started today. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body. What you shall put on is not the life, meant more, is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? Why, and why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for, to, for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Now there's some very powerful and amazing truth that we need to talk about when we talk about this passage 
in Matthew chapter 6. Now the first part is Jesus is comparing the fowls and the lilies and like God created everything that is seen. You know, God, he is the uncreated God. And he created, in Genesis chapter 1, heaven, earth, you know, the, the, all the animals, uh, people, water, sun, moon, star, all of these things. God created all of it. And if God created it, he's responsible for taking care of it. So he, he, he feeds the air, the, the, the lilies and the, and the fowl of the air. I mean, God takes care of everything he created. And Jesus is saying, why do you not believe that God will not do the same for you? He says, O ye of little faith. That's in verse 30. O ye of little faith. He closed the field. You think he won't clothe you? How, how much more valuable are you than the field? You are an eternal soul. You were made in the likeness and in the image of Almighty God himself. You think you you don't think you're more important? God spoke things, but he formed man. You're worth more than the field. The human race is the only eternal souls. You're the only things that will live forever. You're made in the image of Almighty God. When Jesus says, O oh, ye of little faith, I, I love our teachings on faith. If you go watch Blank Slate Ministries Daily Teaching 001, What is Faith? And you watch all of If you take our standard discipleship class and learn about faith, you'll, you'll realize one of, the, one of the main points I make is that faith is like a diamond. There's so many facets. How you look at this diamond, you see trust and confidence and append, dependence and assurance and belief and you see all these facets of the diamond, but that's not what the diamond is. The diamond was coal pressed down. You know, uh, they make diamonds when coal is under extreme pressure and heat, and that's what makes a diamond. So there's qualities that make up the diamond that is not the facets of the diamond. What you, if you can see different things, then that each individual thing is not the makeup because it's changing. We need a definition of the diamond that doesn't change. What is the coal? What's that definition? What's the makeup? What's the internal qualities and characteristics of the diamond? Romans chapter 4, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but that which is of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Therefore it is of faith. That word of, O-F, is indicating the connection between a part and a whole. It's indicating the agent that's connecting a part to a whole. So faith is what connects you a part of the whole body of Christ. So faith, by definition, is a connection. I've said this all, all last year and even into this year. Faith is a vessel. Faith is the mechanism that appropriates the grace of God. It is the connection piece to God. So when Jesus says, O ye of little faith, he's not saying that you don't have enough trust. He's not saying that you don't have confidence. He's saying because you're not connected to God, you don't understand that God will take care of you. Kids that have great parents in their households and they know their parents. Here, here's, a, here's a really good point. If a child knows their parent and they know their parent's going to take care of them, they're so, they're so connected, there's no wonder if there's going to be food in the fridge when they get home. There's no wonder if there's going to be food on the table when they get home. But when the relationship is strained, and that could be many things, abuse, drug abuse, maybe your parents just work too much, maybe they don't have a relationship with you, maybe your parents are divorced, maybe you don't have parents. I, there's many scenarios in which that relationship can be strained or just not there. There's no connection. Well, when there's no connection, how can, you, how can you be assured or confidence or trusting or belief that that person is going to take care of you? That's what Jesus is saying when he's saying, oh, ye a little faith. Because you're not connected, you don't understand. 
One of the most repeated phrases in Jesus in the New Testament is, He that has ears, let him hear. He said, because you don't know the Father, Jesus said, I came to show you the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He said, I came to show you the Father so that you could be connected to him, which will produce the understanding, the revelation, the truth, the assurance, the confidence, the trust, the belief, all of the applications of the, the different facets of faith, that you would be so connected to him, you know you're more valuable than the field. You know that God takes care of you. That's why it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. But before that, it says, your heavenly father knows what you need. He already knows it. He knows what you need and he provides it. But so many people have no connection to God. They don't know that God knows it. They think that when you go into prayer time, I have to pray and tell God what I need. The Bible says he already knows what you need. You don't pray for your needs. It says God supplies all your needs. I don't pray for my needs, church. Not a single time. I, I, I don't pray for my need because God said he would provide for it. I uphold my end of the covenant. I do what I'm supposed to do. You know, I, I give and I sow and I tithe and I give my first fruits to God and I give well above 10%. And I know that God will take care of me. And I know God knows all my needs, so he provides for me. You know, what I, you know what I pray when I pray to God? I pray to God what I want, not what I need. And I seek first the kingdom of God. My lifestyle, my heart, my position. What I focus on doing is seeking God. Because everything else comes. It's all taken care of. I don't have to think about it. I know God knows what I need. It's going to be there when it's supposed to be. It's going to show up. It's going to work. It's... It's not something I, I take no thought for tomorrow. I don't even think about it. People say, how are, how are you going to pay rent? I don't think about it. I, I, I do what I'm supposed to do. God called me to full-time ministry, preach the word, teach you the Bible. So that's what I do. And God supplies my need. Thank, thank you for all of our partners, which sow seed. God moves on somebody's heart and says, hey, sow this amount of money into the ministry. And every time it's what we need. I can give you countless testimonies of being completely out of food at my house. I have nothing to eat and groceries show up. I can tell you, receive an eviction notice. Have no money to pay rent. Rent shows up. Somebody, somebody, somebody will send in a seed. It's the same way with the miracle we're believing God to receive for our building. I know the moment we're ready, the seed will be there. The, the money will show up. Church, I seek first the kingdom of God. This is the most important thing. I don't worry about my need. We spent two days talking about kingdom finance, and it seems like we're talking about it again today. But what I want you to do is not focus on the money, not focus on the need, not focus on... I want you to focus on God. Go to 1 Kings chapter 3. Let's look at the, it says that Solomon was the wisest man. We're going we're gonna to read through this. Chapter 3. And, yeah, 1 Kings 3. Let's just read. And Solomon made affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had made an end of building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall of Jerusalem round about. Only the people sacrificed in high places because there was no house built unto the name of the Lord until those days. And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father. Only he sacrificed and burnt incense in high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was what for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon the altar. And Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, ask what I shall give thee. Now, this is powerful because in Mark 11, it says, Whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Whatever you desire. God is giving Solomon this same promise in the Old Testament in 1 Kings 3. Ask what I shall give thee. Solomon could ask for anything he wanted right here in this moment. But listen what Solomon said. 
And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David my father great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father. But I am, I am but a little child, I know not how to go out or come in. And thy servant is the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast thou asked riches for thyself, nor asked, hast thou asked, the life of thine enemies, but thou hast asked for an understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And if thou wilt walk in my ways, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as thy father David did walk, then will I lengthen thy days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and offered burnt offerings, and offered peace offerings, and made a feast to all his servants. Now, this is powerful because Solomon, right here in verse 12, that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. God made Solomon the wisest man on the whole earth, from before and after him. He's the wisest man that ever lived. He wrote the book of Proverbs. He wrote the Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon is one of my favorite books in the Bible, dealing with the progression of maturity, the progression of, of uh, mature love. But one of the things that I absolutely love about this passage, and, and something that maybe you don't think about when you initially read it, because he became wise. But how wise did he have to be before then to be able to ask so great a thing of God? You know, he, Solomon's not a very old man in this, in this passage. I don't remember how old he is, but he's not very old. He hasn't been king very long. And he's a young man. And this young man has the wisdom from following after his father David to not ask for the other things. He asked for wisdom. He sought first the kingdom of God. His heart was to steward what God had given him. God gave him and made him king over all these people, and he had to steward this gift that God had gave him. So he was like, you know what I'm going to do? You know what I need? You know what I'm going to ask God for? That would be the best thing for me? Give me an understanding heart to, to, to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad for who is able to judge this thy so great a people. Solomon was so wise even before he got wisdom because he made the choice to put serving God and to stewarding the gifts of God above his own gain. That's a, that's a wise man before he got wisdom. It's, it's actually, I, I love, I, I, I don't, most people talk about him being wise because of God, but I want you to know how wise he was before he even asked. Because he had to make the decision to ask that. The speech pleased the Lord that Solomon asked this thing, and God said, because thou hast asked this thing and hast not asked long life, riches, or the life of thy enemies. There's three things he didn't ask for. Now, how wise did Solomon have to be to not ask for those? He could have asked to be rich, and God would have granted it, but he didn't. How many people focus on money or status or long life? They, ask for, they focus on health and money and status over other people. And God said that Solomon was focused on stewarding what God had appointed him to do. He prayed for wisdom. 
Now, one of the most amazing promises about this is in verse 13. It says, I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches, honor, so that there shall not be that so that so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And if thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes that I command, as thy father David did walk, I will lengthen thy days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Now, the, the most amazing parts about this is he said, You didn't ask for riches, long life, or the life of your enemies. And God said, because you didn't ask for those things, I'm going to grant you the wisdom that you did ask for. You asked for wisdom, so I'm going to give you that wisdom. But then I'm also going to give you the riches. He didn't ask for riches, but I'm going to give you riches. If you walk in my ways, I'll give you the long life. And he said, instead of killing your enemies, giving you the life of them, that's what it means, you go and kill them, God said, I'm going to give you peace so that you can live among the kings. Like, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. That I'm going to use my hand in your life to not cause war to triumph over. I'm going to cause my hand on your life to bring forth peace. The blessing of God increases you, but it, it, it produces no, um, no negative effects. And that's what God is saying here. When I bless you, when my hand comes on your life, it produces peace in your life. So many people tried to gain out of the flesh or try to gain in these foolish ways. And the way they do that, it causes strife. It causes turmoil. It causes adversity from other people. It causes conflict. It causes jealousy. God said, when I bring riches into your life i also bring peace in your circle of influence with other people it is peace not adversity church i can tell you i have i have been wealthy i have had abundance i have made a lot of money but it came with turmoil because i was toiling myself it wasn't from god but when the blessing of god comes on my life as i live right now i have peace I don't have to struggle with others over it. Go back into Matthew 6. Verse 29. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Jesus is making this statement about your focus. And he's saying this great man Solomon, the one that became the wisest man ever, who had riches above everybody else, who had peace in the land, who had, who had long life when he walked in the statues of David, his father. Even Solomon was not arrayed like one of these, talking about the lilies of the field. And Jesus said, God will do even more than that in your life. God will bless you more than what you see blessed of Solomon. How many people want to walk in the abundant blessing of God? How many people want to have long life? They want to live a full 120 years. How many people want to have not only long life, but how many people want to be wealthy? And we're not talking about being wealthy for self-gain, but we're talking about having wealth so that you can bless others. How many people want to fully fund a church plant? How many people want to start an orphanage? How many people want to start a, a homeless shelter? What, what if you could just take a check and write two and a half million dollars and stroke a check and hand it to them and pay for it all up front? Give them all the money to do it all. I've listened to pastors give testimonies of having divine encounters with, with mighty men of God who are very wealthy and very blessed. And the person just goes, oh, that's what you need? Here, and writes a four and a half million dollar check. Here you go. Because they are blessed of God, they can bless others. How many people want to have peace in their life? They're tired of having conflict. They're tired of having war. God said that Solomon didn't ask for any of those. What he asked for was wisdom. He wanted to steward the purpose that God had put on his life. He wanted to do it right. 
Same way Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Focus on doing the will of God for your life, walking out your purpose. He said, when you do that, all these things will be added unto you. Your father knows what you need. He knows you need money. He'll bless you. He knows you need peace in your life. He'll make sure that happens. He knows you need health and long life. He, he'll, he'll make sure that happens. All of these things will come into your life. But they come into your life when we don't focus on trying to receive blessings, but we focus on walking out our purpose with God. When we stay connected, Jesus said, O ye of little faith. That doesn't mean you need to just believe God more and you'll finally get your blessings. No, we need to get connected to God. We need to find God's heart. We need to find God's purpose for our life. Because when we do that, then we can walk it out. Jesus said, even Solomon and all his glory wasn't arrayed like one of these. And God, how much more will God do for you? That's the point Jesus is making. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. We're out of time today. So, Father, I thank you. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let the word come alive. Bring forth revelation in our heart as we seek your heart. God, teach us how to stay focused on you. We love you and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Well, I just want to thank everybody that signed up for our curriculums. We are going to have church tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., so please make sure you're joining us then. And I just want to—I want to encourage you before we finish. I, I start—I finished a little early for this encouragement. Listen, we spent two days talking about finances, talking about how to live kingdom financially, and today we talked about the the focus or, or seeking kingdom, seeking the kingdom first. Listen, God wants to do mighty things in your life. Stay focused on Him. We will see you tomorrow. Have a great day. I know